My name is Lacey McDowell. I'm a student in the MBA program here at George Washington um, University. First, I'd like to acknowledge the rest of the team who worked really hard to put this session together. Their names and photos are listed on the screen now. We have an amazing panel for you today. We have Jim Lethup, Fee Noel, Chris Vigilante, and Lane Gray. We are honored that they were here today. Each speaker was speaking for a few minutes. There will be Q&A, and then we will wrap up. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section. And now I will turn the session over to our STEAM moderators to get the show started. All right, thank you for that great introduction, Lacey. So my name is Jody Lee, and I'll be one of your moderat moderators today, along with Lakeisha Lubin. And as Lacey said, we have four excellent speakers today. Jim Lathrop, sales director at Microsoft. Fee Noel, women's wear designer and founder of her namesake lifestyle brand. Chris Vigilante, owner and founder of Vigilante Coffee. And Lane Gray, owner and founder of multiple companies, including her most recent, Gray Lane Beauty. So for the questions, we're starting with Jim today. Um, he's a sales director at Microsoft, leading the retail, restaurant, and hospitality industry strategy sales team for Microsoft's US enterprise software business. Jim, it's so great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, the US enterprise software business, and how COVID-19 has affected your operations? Sure. Uh, so my background, I've been in uh, sales for, for quite a period of time now. I actually started with IBM, spent two years with IBM and on the technical side, spent the last, uh, then spent 18 of the following years with Microsoft in a variety of roles from the, the very technical and presenting technology to our corporate and global customers, uh, as well as sales roles, sales management roles. Uh, I then moved into our, our support business where I worked with our developers on creating a new organization to support our customers, uh, which we grew by 200%. And then uh, moved into our um, partner business, which I was di a director there. I then spent seven years over at Apple, uh, where I would let our retail restaurant and hospitality groups putting together our go-to-market strategies. Um, and more recently, have come back and, and rejoined Microsoft's enterprise team to uh, lead a sales team in the manufacturing vertical. Uh, so helping our customers getting through COVID is cer certainly something that uh, has been important uh, to Microsoft. Um, the business model for Microsoft obviously is, is to allow our customers to do as, as much as they can with technology and we're in, we help them in support of that. The enterprise team that I work with helps customers understand their business challenges, especially during times like COVID, and then uh, helps provide them with solutions, leveraging our technology to, to have them get the most out of what they can do. Wow, thanks so much for that great introduction, Jim. Um, we're asking this next question of every speaker. Um, in light of COVID-19, what is your company's strategy going forward? Yeah, we actually, COVID-19 has obviously impacted us in, in multiple ways, um, both personally inside of Microsoft as well as externally with our customers. Uh, inside of Microsoft, we've got a six stage approach on how we're working with customers. Um, stage one is essentially looking at the organization, uh, and, and in that case, Microsoft is closed. Um, and, and right now we're in what we call our stage two, which is a mandatory work from home. So we've got different stages that go throughout. Uh, stage three is work from home strongly encouraged. Stage four is a soft open. Stage five is open with restrictions. And then finally, we're gonna open up uh, for business completely. Currently, we're in the stage two mandatory work from home part of our business. Uh, when you look at Microsoft uh, and the next stage moving into stage three or where it's work from home strongly encouraged, I think we're saying that we're going to, at this point, looking at June or July for opening from, a, from a, a corporate perspective. Along with that, we have uh, several areas that we uh, focus on. One is in helping the communities. And when you look at the communities, we're helping with things like medical research and helping with clinical studies, using artificial intelligence to help uh, the organizations that are putting together some of these vaccines determine which are going to be the right ones and how quickly we can get those out. We also look at supporting our customers and organizations on the front line. So we're helping with protecting doctors and making sure that we're using HoloLens technology to make sure that we're uh, being able to do surgeries and look at 
look at the medical pro challenges without having to be in contact directly with the with those particular person um, next to you providing information. We've got tools that help allow developers to pivot quickly in a matter of crisis. Um, another area that we're focusing on is the broader and social social economic impact. And so when you look at that, it's really about how do we help customers when they do the same thing as us, which is open their businesses back up either in a soft open or being completely open. We've created a set of tools and technologies that allow corporations to open and work from home. It, al it allows for things like employees to be checked, to reserve workspaces, uh, to provide barcodes, to ensure that uh, any contact tracing is done inside the uh, organization. And we provide that to corporations for free. That's just one of the examples. Um, but there, there are plenty more. And then finally, the last thing we're, we're, we're kind of doing here is uh, sharing best practices with, on around remote work. So we obviously have uh, things like Zoom and, and in the case of Microsoft, we have Microsoft Teams. We've helped countless organizations get set up on Microsoft Teams to be able to, to work uh, remotely in, this, in the times that we're having currently. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you for that insight, Jim. It sounds like Microsoft is taking a lot of steps in light of COVID-19. Um, and now I'll turn things over to my co-moderator, Lakeisha, uh, to introduce our next uh, fantastic speaker. Thank you, Jody. It's my pleasure to introduce Fina Well, woman's wear designer, owner, founder of her successful Fina Well lifestyle brand. Fee, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your company, and the effect COVID-19 has had on your business? Hi, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Felicia Noel. I am design and founder of my namesake brand, Fee Noel. And Fee Noel was initially started about six, seven years ago, and we wanted to bring uh, just a new, a new way of wearing clothes and a new vibe to women's wear. I'm of Grenadian culture, uh, and I wanted to bring that to American fashion. So we encourage our women to eat well, travel often, and dress to inspire. And we've been pushing that message and honing in on it for quite some time. And it is what what the pandemic did for us was strengthen that message, um, how we've changed and how we've pivoted. We still encourage our women to make life beautiful. And instead of, because we've had to stay in place uh, because of the pandemic, we, we're now, we've now changed our message to paradise is wherever you are and make life beautiful wherever you are and look for the silver lining throughout life's strategies. So that's what we've been pushing. That's what has been resonating with people. And it's quite interesting that the pandemic has been a gift and a curse for us. It took our business to the next level with that, that, um, that model just resonating with people with people looking to find, you know, some form of hope and, and some form of happiness throughout all these tragedy, tr sorry, tragedies that we've been going through. So with the clothes, you know, what we've tried to always do is make it more than just you buying pretty clothes. It's a message. It's the way it makes you feel. And we tie that to how we give back in the world, you know, how we connect with other communities, how we connect with our communities. And, um, you know, I'm trying to put all of it in one so you understand our pivot as well as how we started off and how it has been so much in line with what we've already been practicing and preaching um, throughout the entire uh, trajectory of the business. Well, wow, thank you, that's inspiring. Um, and the next question we're asking, in light of COVID, what kind of strategies do you have going forward? B, that's for you. Hello? Felicia, yes. In light of COVID, what kind of strategies do your company have moving forward? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? The, uh, you, you, the internet went out a bit. Oh, sure. So in light of COVID, what kind of strategies your company have moving forward? So in light of COVID, uh, before COVID, we were made to order, meaning that we would only make someone order once it was purchased. Since then, we've had to completely switch up our production and um, basically do production um, in New York so that we can supply Again, people started buying more, just being at home, having to get dressed up for Zoom. So we've 
essentially switched our business model. And what we've done, which it hasn't come out yet, but we've created clothes that you can wear at home, that you can wear around the house, but still step outside with. So essentially loungewear. And that is something new that we, we've we really honed in on in light of you know everything that's going on. So we really want to, of course, reflect the times, but still give people just something that makes them happy, um, something that can, you know, help them escape uh, the normal things that's going on in the world. So our business model is more emotional than, than anything else and just finding a way to our, connect to our consumers and get them through this time. Right, even with the Zoom call, you still wanna look pretty. <laughs> been wonderful to have you here. Um, I'm going to turn things back to Jody. Thanks, Lakeisha. Our next excellent speaker is Chris Vigilante, the owner, founder, and roaster of Vigilante Coffee. Hi, Chris. We're so glad to hear from you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your company and business model, and how COVID-19 has affected your operations? Yeah, sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Vigilante. I am the founder of Vigilante Coffee Company. My role there is mainly as green buyer. Uh, so that what that means is I procure our raw coffee from farms all over the world. And then I also serve as the CEO of the company. And uh, our, our, our business model is a retail wholesale model. So we have two cafes and we also roast coffee for other businesses, as well as a, a, an online store where we provide subscriptions and coffee direct to consumers. So we have both a retail and a wholesale model. Um, we've experienced uh, dramatic changes due to COVID, I think like most businesses. Uh, we closed both of our cafes for a small period of time uh, and then transitioned to a takeout only model, which we're still operating under. And uh, we've also experienced uh, interruptions in our wholesale business because of restaurants, hotels, uh, music venues that we work with, um, also, uh, you know, battling this, this crisis and dealing with it in different ways. So we've kind of seen it in multiple areas. Our online business has actually grown um, pretty significantly, uh, over 100% since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, that's common um, within our industry and coffee roasters throughout the country uh, in the specialty market. Uh, yeah. And then my background, um, got in coffee in Hawaii in 2008 while I was still in college, uh, started working with farms there in Hawaii. It's the only state that produces coffee. I, California does now a little bit, but mainly Hawaii and, uh, learned coffee from the farm to the cup, learned how to roast there, learned how to operate as a barista, uh, was a coffee professional in Washington, DC for a number of years as I pursued starting my business. And we've been around since about 2012 and uh, have grown organically over the years. Wow, what a journey. Um, just one more question for you. In light of COVID-19, can you give us insight into your, your total strategy going forward? Yeah, it's ensuring our staff feel good uh, about operating, about coming to work. That was our number one priority is, uh, you know, we can't have a business if we don't have a team. And we wanted to make sure that they felt uh, comfortable coming to work and hence our transition into a takeout only model that we've maintained to this point. Um, using our own judgment on how to operate uh, safely, but also looking to, uh, you know, uh, guidelines from health experts, scientists, and, and pivoting as we need to, and, um, and also dictating our own timeline as when we resume normal operations. And, and, and when I say use our own judgment, I mainly mean to that. Um, and uh, internally really continuing to focus on what keeps us inspired, uh, I think is something that uh, we've really tried to do throughout the pandemic is, is look inward. How can we improve as a company internally? Um, how can we bring a better online experience to our customers. These have all been things that uh, we've tried to transition and keep focused on. Wow, really incredible. Thank you so much again. Um, and now back to Lakeisha to introduce our final speaker. Thank you, Jody. So our final speaker is Lane Gray, entrepreneur, founder of multiple companies, and also an author. Her recent company is Gray Lane Beauty, the Dollar Shave, the Dollar Shave excuse me, Club of Mascara. 
Lane, can you tell us a little bit more about your story, your company, and how COVID-19 has affected your business? First off, thanks for um, letting me be here. I'm very excited. Also, congratulations to all of you for working on your MBAs. That's really a great achievement, and I think you're doing a wonderful job. So a little bit more about me. Um, as you said, my um, I've started other companies. My background is all in technology for large companies as well as small. Um, the largest I work um, in technical marketing on specifically the Unix operating system um, at Oracle Corporation and ran that division. Um, and then I started a conference production company specifically focused on the technology industry and grew, grew that um, quite large. Um, as you say, I am an author, which was always a dream of mine. I had a story in mind and no, it is not autobiographical, which so many people ask. And um, it never got onto the New York uh, Times bestseller list, but I do have a little bit of a cult following who are pressuring me to do a, um, a sequel uh, to it. So that's somewhere in, uh, around number 18 on my list of things to do. <laughs> um, I've been doing angel investing for the last few years, um, mostly customer uh, focused, so B to C. Um, and you may know, uh, you may have heard of Rothy's or Birdie's, um, uh, a bunch of companies. I have one um, that has uh, been acquired by Procter & Gamble uh, called This Is L. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been a really um, interesting aspect. So I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades. And so that takes us to Gray Lane Beauty um, because I noticed that uh, one time that my mascara was starting to get really clumpy and was flaking and I looked for an expiration date on it and there was none. And so I started researching it and found that the industry really doesn't focus on, on when to replace your mascara despite the FDA and the American Society of Ophthalmologists um, uh, recommending every two to four months replacing. And so, mm -hmm. as you say, I, I say that it, it's basically the Dollar Shave Club of mascara. Mm -hmm. And our model is a little bit different. Um, I grew up with many sisters and we were always excited when the Avon lady, and I'm sure most of you don't even remember that era, but when the Avon lady <laughs> would come uh, to see our mother, she would bring us all these little um, lipsticks that we could play around with. So how it works for uh, Gray Lane Beauty is when a visitor comes to the site, they answer a few questions and a fun little quiz. And based on their preferences uh, through that process, we recommend one of our discovery sets. And so this is a discovery set. And what they get is that they get three Travis size mascaras. The value is $30. We offer it to them with a promo code everywhere on our website. Um, called first set so they can get it uh, for $10. Um, uh, and then they can play around like me with the Avon lipsticks. They can play around with different mascaras. And I think that's one of the barrier barriers to entry, so to speak, of people who want to try a new mascara. It's the cost, they're used to their other one. They don't really wanna try different things. So this makes it a fun and an engaging experience for them. Then the next, uh, phase is we strongly encourage them um, to sign up for a membership, which we would prefer to call it over a subscription, um, because we want to create a sense of community. Um, and they would either do a quarterly, which is how often we recommend that they change their mascara, um, or they could do it um, more often if they so chose, or they could do an annual subscription. But we allow them out of any one of our um, of our subscription membership options. So that is the model of the company. That's amazing. That's, that's a really cool concept. Um, so my next question is similar to um, what we asked all the speakers. In light of COVID, what is your company strategy moving forward? And I know you have many, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, ho hopefully we have some very strong <laughs> specific ones. Um, so our first is, um, is easy for us. Um, and mm -hmm. that is that we, um, we talk about safety. And so I've got an advisor, um, an ophthalmologist out of New York who has developed and patented, patented her own products um, 
that will be going into a new product that we'll be releasing um, uh, uh, Q1 of 2021. And it happens to be a, a um, mascara uh, remover, but it has hyaluronic acid and a host of other soothing and um, uh, aspects that will enhance um, uh, the skin around the eyes. Um, so our focus is, is during COVID is very, very much on safety and really bringing forth that, which we have currently no competitors in this area. And so really honing in on safety, safety, safety. And, um, and being the type of company that we are, we want to be very transparent. We showcase what our our profit margins are or are not. For example, the discovery set I showed you is at a break even at the $10 uh, mark. We also are a clean beauty uh, company, meaning we don't use any bad ingredients um, in our mascaras. Um, and so we're also a B corporation. And if you're familiar with B Lab, um, it's, it's um, taking into consideration all constituents and, and all strategic um, areas. And finally, we give back uh, a dollar um, for every full-size mascara that's sold to an organization called Build On. And our area of focus is on adult literacy. Um, and we are, we happen to be focused on Nepal. And I feel from the bottom of my heart and as a founder, get to put that out there um, in the in the uh, company uh, that literacy is and education is um, is the base for really changing our society in general. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Social corporate responsibility. <laughs> that's 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 important. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you. And Jody, we'll start with our next segment. Thank you, Akisha. Um, so for our next segment, we've actually prepared some questions specifically for each of our speakers. So we're actually going to start with Jim again. Um, Jim, so we know that Microsoft transitioned from a licensing model to a subscription based software as a service model. Uh, can you tell us why Microsoft made that switch? And do you think COVID-19 has pushed other companies to make this transition? Yeah, th thanks, Jody. I, I think that um... You know, there, I think there's a variety of reasons that we we did the switch. Some of which was the speed at which technology was moving. Uh, back when we used to, for those of you that remember, installs from CDs, DVDs, tapes, or I could keep going, punch cards. Um, you know, it was more of an upgrade, and you got a set of features that were delivered via a different vehicle. With the with the kind of the advent of the internet, when when and the prevalency of of the internet and home based. Uh, facilities, <clears throat> our consumer business and our corporate business was, were more demanding downloads. And as we started to get into the digital download business, that moved us to a model where customers were asking for features and things that would help them solve either problems at home or challenges in the business uh, environment on a more frequent basis. And so part of a subscription model is the fact that we can continue to update the, the software on an iterative basis and provide those features at a much quicker pace, uh, keeping up with what consumer and corporate demand is. Um, the, the other piece of it is subscription models allow you to, and then speaking more to the corporation side now, allow you to scale up or down uh, the number of licenses that you have. So. When you think about the old models of buying a set number of perpetual licenses, if I have 50,000 employees in my organization and due to a pandemic like COVID, I reduced to 25,000, that can put you in a pretty uh, bad situation given the capital that you had to put out for that. And so a subscription model somewhat allows for, depending upon the type of agreement you have, flexibility in that environment, allowing our customers who have things like a furlough to be able to, uh, to adjust for that. Um, those are just some of the examples, but the, the list goes on and on. Um, subscriptions are providing our, our organizations with the ability to go on a month to month versus a quarterly or annual. And there are a variety of ways that we, we work with that. Um, when you think about how COVID impacts the subscription model, we have had significant business downturn impact um, from our customers who are, have had to furlough people. And so uh, the subscription model has allowed us to be a little bit flexible going forward on as those customers come up for their annual agreements or for their 
uh, annual payments, allowing them to make adjustments to their agreements to downsize for the furlough that they've had, thus allowing them to uh, save operational costs as well. Um, I think as we look at uh, the opportunity with COVID, um, not just from a subscription perspective, but the opportunity to help our customers, that's truly where we're finding that we can make significant impact, whether it's, you know, when I when I think about what I talked about from the AI and, and the ability to look at different people who are making vaccines or the ability for us to provide, you know, come, return to work type applications for organizations or whether it's the ability uh, for us to continue to help um, organizations uh, just from societal uh, impact. Um, so we're working in all different aspects. We're, we're excited about the opportunity in front of us. The vertical that I'm in manufacturing specifically uh, is an example of we weren't ready uh, as a U.S. or world for this type of a pandemic, not only from a health perspective, but from an organizational perspective. And so the opportunity, uh, kind of closing on this, the opportunity that's in front of us is truly to help uh, our environment, our industries become more agile. Manufacturers didn't know where their supplies were. Supplies were on ships. They couldn't find out where the ships were. The ships couldn't get it to the planes because those people were out of work. And so it just created a, gi a gigantic uh, visibility to a, an industry that uh, is going to need some significant impact. So we're excited about, uh, while unfortunately we're in the pandemic, excited about the opportunity in front of us uh, to help our customers in new and unique ways, whether it's through subscription or perpetual licenses, but being able to help them transform their businesses. That was an incredible answer, Jim. I. I love the point that you made that it really allows companies to be a lot more flexible, um, especially if they need to go on a month to month basis, or as you said, with furloughed workers. And that's really exciting that Microsoft is now working in the manufacturing sector. So yeah, incredible. Thank you so much. Um, and so now back to Lakeisha for our next question. Thank you, Jody. Our next question is for you, Fina Well. Given what's happened with COVID, what innovation would you think will come out specifically from the fashion industry? And another part of this question, what advice would you give an entrepreneur who's trying to, who's working on pivoting their business at this time? Thank you, Lakeisha, um, for that question. Uh, it's very interesting in the fashion industry now. Um, and I think that people are already pivoting their companies. Like for instance, Fashion Week happened digitally this year, which was so strange because it's really a touch C uh, industry where you know, you're know you constantly congregating and going to fashion shows and touching the clothes and feeling the clothes. So now what's happening here is you really have to create an experience that could res resonate digitally and really you know allow your customers, your buyers to get your, like get the feel and, and, and not only the feel, but the message online, uh, which I must say, I'm not sure that I'm happy with, but I know a lot of brands in the fashion industry had um, amazing feedback from doing that. One of my peers did a digital fashion show with, with digital models, you know, which is really insane because we're used to um, models walking down the runway. I think that that is going to continue to push forward. I think they are definitely going to push the digital model on a platform uh, so where people all over the world can experience it at once. And that's the part that's great about it is that right. it, I guess in short, it's becoming more inclusive. Whereas before you had to be invited to see some of the latest fashions that was coming out where now you can sit on your computer and feel like you're there and feel like you're a part of that community or that brand. Um, so I guess that is the silver lining in that. For uh, Fee Noel personally, where a lot of brick and mortars are closing down, we've actually came up with the idea to create private shopping um, experiences where we'll open, you know, um, very small ateliers just around the city and in different parts of the world where someone can have a private shopping experience where they can still try on, feel, touch, um, and feel like, like they're out shopping, you know, just without all the, 
hoopla and the customers and still keeping themselves safe. So essentially it'll be catered to them. We'll know they're coming, we'll be prepared and we'll make it an experience. Maybe they'll be allowed to bring a friend. So we're still working that out, but that's something that we thought is still needed. You know, everything cannot be digital for someone like myself. I have to be able to try on to decide if I want to buy. And um, there's a lot of people in the world who feel the same way. So although there, I, I think there's a balance in everything. So I'm happy that things are, more people are being able to be included in the process of fashion. Some human interaction involved as well. Right, that's that's amazing. I like that idea where you have your own personal shopping and still social distancing at the same time. Um, thank you, Fee. Um, and I do have some more questions that we'll ask during the um, Q&A session. So now I'll turn it over to Jody. Thanks, Lakeisha. Um, so this next question is for Chris Vigilante. And um, I know, Chris, that you have gone over a lot of uh, over your different strategies that you've implemented, but what strategies do you think have worked best for you so far in 2020, especially with the effect of COVID-19? And if an individual was interested in starting a similar company, is there maybe one specific strategy that you would recommend? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, for our <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I think pivoting towards um, <clears throat> a, a really big focus on our online store and our online experience, uh, which began in 2019, has been tremendous uh, and enabled us to grow uh, and, and grow well throughout the pandemic. So that would be a strategy I'd suggest for anybody looking to enter my particular industry. Um, I think that the strategy varies depending on the individual, depending on the business. So I can only testify to uh, what we've implemented and what we found successful. Um, one second, sorry. I'm getting a look at my notes here. Could you repeat that question one more time? Sure. Um, basically, what strategies have worked best for you so far in 2020? especially with the effect of COVID-19. I know you've done online sales, then the subscription model, retail and wholesale. Mm -hmm. So maybe were there certain ones that worked best for you? Um, you know, like I said, we started putting our concentration into the online uh, arena in a very a significant way in 2019. So that poised us to enter 2020 in a healthy uh, way. And so, um, I'd say just continue to remain locked in on that. Um, our retail situation is, is, is as positive as one could hope for right now. And uh, coffee's a bit pandemic proof. Uh, people always need their coffee and it lends itself well to the takeout model. So again, I feel really fortunate to be in a business that can do that. And uh, we feel for those that aren't as fortunate. Um, one thing that we've we've done, what I think a lot of businesses are doing, is using their platform for uh, a voice for change, uh, whether that's with uh, racial inequality or uh, you know things related to the pandemic or, or what have you, things that we're passionate about. And so we continue to remain focused on what we're passionate about, uh, so that we can stay inspired, yeah, even during times when you know uh, there's a lot of negativity out there. So. Um, yeah, that's what I, would be my general answer to that question. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Um, and now uh, back to Lakeisha for our final question. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. So a final question is for you, Wayne Gray. Um, so like you, you, you touched on this a little bit. So we know that you're involved in multiple businesses. If you can tell us which one you're most excited about and um, you can probably elaborate on this a little more and how COVID-19 has impacted your business in that particular. Oh, okay, cool. Well, mm -hmm. obviously I'm most excited about Gray Lane Beauty because that mm -hmm. is what my 60 to 80 hour work weeks um, are focused on. Um, mm -hmm. The investing, the angel investing, which is what I believe you're alluding to, um, that is relatively passive, although I do talk to the founders on a regular um, basis. I'm excited because one of the companies is um, uh, considering um, they're doing so well uh, that they're considering um, 
uh, financial opportunities. Since I've already said all the names, um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I should not um, say anything more. Um, uh, that's the downside, I guess, to having inside um, info. So, um, so I'm letting them all do um, what they want, the angel uh, investments. And if, if and when any of them want my help, I provide that. Back to Gray Lane Beauty. Um, uh, COVID has not been a deterrent for us because when you have a mask on, the only thing you see are the eyes. And right. so um, interestingly, um, or not, um, but we think it's interesting is that we have really focused on hyper vertical markets. Um, and one of those, the first one uh, was an essential worker campaign that we did um, uh, for discovery sets. And we were so honored with the almost a thousand um, essential workers who sent in photos of themselves and there was to be one winner. And I was so overwhelmed by, by the stories they were telling um, that um, I, we ended up giving every single one of them a discovery set, which was a big project. Then we did a super superhero nurse and somebody had to nominate someone um, for that. And we just finished a uh, superhero mom um, campaign as well for one um, annual subscription. Uh, but what we've ended up, um, we got over 2,600 entries into that. And so what we do is we do a lot of testing. So when you ask negative or positive in, in COVID, we really are, are looking at um, where we're sending people and what their interactions are. So we have a host of analytical tools to tell us where somebody moves into our site, what they're interested in, and through our newsletter, we also, obviously, as everybody knows, you can see, you know, how many opens you have, etc. Um, and we send them to, on these super hyper vertical market um, groups, we send them to specific landing pages that are designed specifically for them. So you can never see it. If you guys went into Gray Lane Beauty, you would never be able to know where to look for these kinds of uh, pages, but they, um, but they address the specific needs. So, um, so COVID has not been a negative um, for us. I think price that the other um, speakers would agree with, I anticipate price is always an issue, but there are three levels in beauty. There is value, that's the drugstore brands. There's prestige, which are in Sephora, Ulta, et cetera. And then the, the, there are luxury uh, brands, which are usually in department stores. And we fit right into that prestige brand or prestige category. Um, and, um, but then we offer you know, various discounts depending on the type of promotion that we're trying to run, et cetera. Thank you for that. That is true. With my mask, I do focus more on my eyes and making sure I have my mascara and eyeshadow. So that's great. Um, so thank you, Lynn, Lynn. And I also want to say thank you to all the speakers for your, just the fantastic um, information you have shared with us today and your insight. Yes. So now we're going to start with the Q&A session. Jody, back to you. Yes. Hi, thanks, Lakeisha. And again, thank you so much to our amazing speakers today. So we do have a few minutes for a quick Q&A session. So you can enter your questions into that Q&A box at the bottom and uh, we can go through and answer any questions and um, we can look at that now. And if you don't have any, that's no problem. We have plenty of questions for the speakers as well. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes. <laughs> So let's see. And yeah, so I'll also check the chat. But again, there is that Q&A box at the bottom as well. And no worries. I think, Lakeisha, you mentioned you had a question for Fee. Oh, I did. Um, so Felicia, you mentioned the brick and mortar and having that um, personal experience and touch experience. What would you say, and I probably know the answer to this since you mentioned that, what would you say would be the trend moving forward now that a lot of businesses are transitioning from brick and mortar to e-commerce?
Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I'll mute. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, I was saying now that businesses are moving from brick and mortar to e-commerce and essentially they're forced to, you know, to move towards that direction due to COVID, what would you say would be the trend moving forward um, when it comes to the fashion industry? Well, I feel like, as mentioned before, um, the industry is moving digitally. Like they're trying to take, and they are taking everything digital, market appointments, digital, runway shows, digital. Um, I'm kind of going against that trend a little bit and taking a chance with my, with my business model. But uh, the industry as a whole is definitely finding ways to be innovative um, with technology. And we're going to see a lot of new birth measure, measuring technology, all types of technology uh, is in process right now about how to engage the customer and how to keep them engaged and how to fulfill them um, with a digital experience. So that's where, I, that's where I would say where the market is absolutely going. As uh, for Fina Well, we've always engaged with our customers digitally and now we're, and, and we are online based, but we are in a position where we want um, human interaction, which is the timing is, <laughs> is crazy, but I still feel like um, creating an experience for our consumers will go a long way and will be worthwhile, especially from everyone being on lockdown and being inside. People want to travel again, uh, but of course do it safely. So that's what we, we are thinking hard and long about, like how can we create an experience that, that's safe? But the industry is absolutely thinking is how can we create, how can we make digital as fun as an in-person interaction? Like if they're not coming into our stores, what can we create to keep their attention span online? Right, keeping that interaction. Great. Jody, do you have any more questions? Sure, we, it looks like we do have a question in our Q&A. It looks like for, um, the question is for Ms. Lame, uh, what other industries do you predict will move to a subscription model in the future? Unmute me. What other um, industries will go to a subscription model? Great question. Um, um, I think I think anything that has a relatively short shelf life. Um, so um, uh, so I'm developing. I have a patent actually on um, what I'm uh, currently calling smart mascara. I can't use that name ultimately because it's already uh, trademarked, but um, it is a mascara that actually tells you when it's time to change. Um, and um, so it's an interesting direction strategy for us. Um, however, it butts up against, uh, does not complement our current business uh, subscription business model. Um, but I want to carry it over to other industries as well. So short shelf life products, uh, like um, I think of baby food. Um, mm -hmm. How many times you open that, that jar and the potential of bacteria getting into it and causing problems. Um, I see other cosmetics. Um, there's the trend is uh, many of you know, uh, with all the boxes that are out there, the Ipsy, the BoxyCharm, um, there's just a multitude of boxes. In fact, um, the cosmetic chemist and uh, uh, my uh, mascara comes out of Milan where all the best mascaras, most of the best mascaras come out of, he actually has me advising him and, um, about doing boxes in Italy because it's not a phenomenon. But boxes in general, are going on the on the downside because, as um, Jim had pointed out earlier, um, with regards to Microsoft, is you know people um, are have less money, um, and when you open up some of these boxes and it's a bunch of samples, etc., it's not a great experience, and um, we're in the unique position that. It says, as soon as you get your new mascara, it's time to throw out your old mascara. So there's a real fundamental principle underneath it, um, which is great. So I see other cosmetic companies doing it. I also see um, other industries, again, with short shelf life. So. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Lane. Um, let's see, I'm looking through our Q&A for another question. It looks like this is a general one. Um, in the midst of COVID-19 issues, it's from Steve, and the need to pivot and stay relevant, how do you involve your team members to consistently be innovative? And I think, Chris, you were actually touching on how you were um, motivating your team as well and keeping them engaged. Um, yeah, to, I remind my staff all the time that innovations happen at the ground level and that uh, oftentimes uh, simple uh, adjustments in how we do something uh, with our production space, you know, how we package and prepare our coffees to go out to our customers throughout the country. Um, simply rearranging the way the machinery might be, um, adding a new tool that you think might be cool. Maybe even uh, trying a, a slightly modified design on an existing tool, just an idea that you have and seeing if it works. And so I kind of encourage them to, to try those things and fail um, because it can lead to discovery. And, um, and, and I think when you remind your team that um, anybody can innovate uh, and, and remind them what innovation is. It's, it's as small as, you know, uh, doing something with a slight modification, but dramatically different. I often think of uh, Dogfish Head, the brewery, uh, Sam Calione there, he created the 60 minute IPA using an old school uh, board game that shook like this while he poured hops through it so that it continually, uh, brewed into the beer, the hops, and it was continually hop beer, and he took out a patent for it and it became uh, what it is today, which is a very, you know, well-recognized beer and famous throughout the industry. So um, small things like that can lead to, to big things. And so I just remind them of that and uh, encourage them to try and to fail and to try again. That's great. Uh, Definitely uh, uh, failing. I was going to add on to what Chris said. I think, you know, during these times, meeting more often uh, because it's virtual is important. And, you know, part of part of being motivated, motivating employees to have those innovative ideas is continuing to keep them excited about what they're doing in an environment that is very tough. And, and it's tough from a multitude of ways in today's society. And so, you know, we've done things that are that are different and strange, like having a virtual happy hour where we send five little bottles of wine to to each employee. And then we we have someone host a session where we all have a happy hour together because we weren't didn't have the opportunity to get together. Um, or we do that in partnership with some of our partners where we're trying to get to know the partner better, but we don't really have the opportunity to meet in person. Um, anything you can do to, to keep employees thinking a little bit differently um helps and then i think with like what chris said sharing the smallest of ideas sometimes becomes the biggest so that's important yeah definitely i would love to get a few bottles as well for a happy hour <laughs> that's they were incredible. they were small bottles jody not the big ones <laughs> But thank you so much, Jim. And again, thanks everyone for your wonderful questions. And now to Lacey for our final closing comments. So I just want to thank all of our panelists. Um, what an amazing session we've had. Um, we've learned so much. And I want to thank all of our guests for attending um, this session. And don't forget, there are some other great sessions out this conference. Please make sure that you check them out. And again, thank you all for attending. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.